hello everybody welcome to my racing life here on racing tv my guest today is a man who rode 1364 winners in his career on six separate occasions he rode a hundred winners a season he was a top class international jockey who rode horses the right way with patience and with skill his career unfortunately uh, came to an end after a horror fall on the white turf at San Moritz, but since then he has turned his hand to being a very successful jockey's agent and indeed a welcome member of Racing TV as a pundit. He is, of course, George Baker. Welcome, George, to My Racing Life. How are you? Good afternoon, Angus. Yeah, I'm extremely well, thank you, at these trying times, but um, as everyone is, we're just making the best of a very, very bad situation. Yeah, has cabin fever set in yet? Um, slightly. Um, we're quite lucky in the respect that we've got a horse down the road and I've got to go and do them every day. So it kind mm -hmm. of breaks a day up. So, And I've been doing plenty of exercise, so um, a little bit. But we're lucky we've got two young children and they've been keeping us on our toes. Good stuff, George. In a moment or two, we're going to take uh, you through your racing life. But first of all, before we look at the horses that really influenced your career and horses that were very important to you, uh, where did it all begin, George? Why did you get involved in racing and how did you do so? It all started um, with my father, who's a farrier based in the Lambourne area. And I sort of got into riding ponies at a young age and would spend plenty of time with him at the races. He, he, he used to um, cover Newbury race courses, a race course farrier, Bath race course. So he used to go racing with him at the weekends and so on. And I just got the racing bug really. And um, he organized for me at a young age. I think I was sort of just turned 12 to start riding out for a small trainer just outside Lambourne. And it just snowballed from there really. Yeah, there's a nice story in your book, Taking My Time, in which you uh, talk about seeing your careers master at school, who tried to dissuade you from becoming a, a jockey, but that was what you always wanted to be. Yeah, I had my heart set on it from a very young age, sort of end of primary school time, really. And no matter what Mr. Asman said to me, he wasn't going to change my mind. So um, he was talking to deaf ears as such. Yeah, indeed. Who did you start off with, George? I was based with Mark Usher as an apprentice. And then he moved through to um, train for Heidi Sweeten, which is just outside Marlborough. So I was with Mark Usher through nearly all of my apprenticeship. And um, he was it was a very good base. I, he was a family friend. My dad worked for him for since I was alive, really. And um, they knew us extremely well. And he, he looked after me and gave me plenty of opportunities. Only a small stable, but um, it was really good leg up and um, they were very helpful to me, the ushers. You became a, a very accomplished horseman, very stylish jockey, a jockey who could judge pace very well indeed. Where did those skills come from, George? Who, who helped you hone those skills? So I used to watch a lot of racing at home um, when it was on, on, on the TV. And it was quite a natural thing for me early doors because I was so short to look tidy. But as I got taller, um, sort of my late teens, I had to really concentrate to tidy myself up. And I looked up to certain riders and I suppose Ray Cockman was someone that I always looked up to who, who wasn't particularly tall as such, but struggled with his weight at times. And then Richard Hughes, who was the ultimate stylist for me, very tidy, tall rider, um, just proved that you can tuck yourself away, you've just got to work at it. Yeah, yeah. OK, George, let's uh, run through your racing life. We're going to start in 2007 uh, with a horse that I think was really important to you, really got you going. Wake up, Maggie. Sander Camillo from Puggy in second. Leopoldi, costume. Wake up, Maggie on the far side, Scarlet Runner. Then Sesmen.
followed uh, back in the field by Vital Statistics and uh, now making ground is Lady Grace out white. Tartiel in a blue with the white epaulets is beginning to pick up and Selinka very wide on the extreme right in the red jacket. Majestic Roy go well at the back of the field but will have to pass most of them to win. Up ahead though Puggy has just about come through to head them off. Tackled now by Costume in the pink caps come there very strongly. Leopoldo in between the pair. Wake up Maggie looking to the outside. Selinka is charging home. Also charging at the Majestic Roy but with a lot to do. Wake up Maggie gets past Costume now as they run up to the line. Wake up Maggie beats Costume. Redstone Dancer back in third. George punching the air there as he wins the Oak Tree Stakes in 2007 at Goodwood on Wake Up Maggie beating Costume and Redstone Dancer was back in third place. George, prior to that success at Goodwood, you'd had a number of high-profile winners. I think you'd won the Winter Derby at Lingfield already in your career, but she was pretty important to you, wasn't she? That seemed to mean a lot to you. Yeah, um, as it turned out, she was my first group winner. And I was sort of a young young jockey trying to make his way out in, in, in a very competitive industry. And Chris Wall gave me the opportunity to ride her. She was obviously a filly that I was saw a lot at home. She had a high level of form as a two-year-old. She was group one place. I think she was second in the Chivoli Park behind Donna Bellini. And she was a very... She was a better class horse than I'd been involved with for a long time. So to get the leg up on her was a massive confidence boost for me. And to break my group duck was a massive day for me on, on, a, on, a, on a big stage as, as Glorious Goodwood is. Just looking at the closing stages of the race once again, would it be fair to say that she had her, her quirks and her, her, her ways about her? She wasn't the easiest ride. Just explain what sort of a ride she was. She was awkward in, in the respect that she took a bit of settling early doors and getting her into a, a rhythm. And she, it was, that was a key thing with her. She was very talented, but getting her to use her energy in the right way and at the, in the right part of the race and getting her to relax it into a smooth rhythm. And she won earlier in the year, that, that year, um, the, the Group 3 Phillies race at Lingfield, I think Richard Hughes rode her. And Hughes is obviously the ultimate at getting horses to relax into a rhythm. So I was very aware of that was a key thing to do with her. And once, once, once you did that, she, you know, that she was, a, as, as I said, Group 1 place as a two-year-old and, and, a, and a dual Group 3 winner. Yeah, distribution of energy is something we talk about a lot these days uh, when we're analysing races and pace, of course. Uh, was it something that even at those tender years, George, in 2007, when you were making your way in the game, was that something that you were very conscious of? For, for me, Angus, I think the most important thing for a jockey is to, is to keep things smooth and in the rhythm. Mm -hmm. And I was always, that was one thing I always tried to work at. And with a filly like her, it was key to get her to use her energy in the right way, mm -hmm. almost to get her to in a rhythm, breathe in nice and smooth, so she could finish her race off and use that acceleration he ha she had at the right time rather than burn herself at early doors. Yeah, and, and presumably trying to get a, a smooth run at all times rather than getting checked and, and stopped with perhaps a filly who thinks a little bit. Exactly, to produce at the right time mm. and not give, a, give your rivals chance to come back at you if they're the type that sort of ease up in front and she and she just you, you had to use her energy at the right time and hit the front as late as you dare sort of thing yeah something you were very good at um mention her trainer if we could chris wall he's still going strong he's still training plenty of winners had a lot of good horses he was important to you in your career wasn't he massively important to have the faith in in a young rider and i've been involved with him since i was an apprentice mm on a small scale and I started riding out for him regularly, driving up to Newmarket once, twice a week. To give me that leg up to, on those better class horses, that's what I sort of needed to make the next step. And um, Chris was able to do that for me and he gave me plenty of confidence to, to ride those nicer types of horses, which I... Which I Apologies, uh, we have lost George for the moment. Uh, the vagaries of uh, talking to uh, our pundits and uh, friends and uh, jockeys uh, through this particular medium. We will try and get him back in a moment or two. He was talking about uh, Chris Wall, a, a brilliant trainer, Chris. He really is. And he trained Wake Up Maggie. We just saw winning the Oak Tree Stakes there. And he also trained a horse who uh, 
uh, well, George had a tremendous association with the horse in the orange there, Premio Loco. Premier Loco continues to have the run of the race out in front to Thistlebird in second place. Al Jami here in the centre of the blue and white cap is just encouraged to get closer. On the right, Chai Chomadi beginning her run and Trumpet Major is next to her. 300 yards to go, five of them in line. On the left, Premier Loco, Chai Chomadi is coming through, battling on well is Thistlebird. Al Jami here is there with a chance as well. Thistlebird is just in front of the half foul on pole. Al Jammer here being forced through by Paul Hannigan to join her. Premier Loco fighting back. Premier Loco got up. George Pink have won it on Premier Loco. The thistle burden Al Jammer here. That was five years later on from the success we showed you previously, uh, Wake Up Maggie in 2007, Premier Loco winning the Celebration Mile at Goodwood in, in 2012. And perhaps we could just continue a little bit where we left off because Premier Loco was trained by Chris Wall, as was Wake Up Maggie. And I just wanted to, to get your thoughts on, on Chris Wall as a trainer and how important he was to you. He's massively important to me. He sort of took me from that next level to, to ride in better class races, black type races as such. And he gave me plenty of confidence. He was a very easy person to ride for. Um, he never really got cross or angry. He understood the dynamics of r race riding. He was a very good race reader and a very calm influence. And that, that, that came through to his jockeys. He gave you plenty of confidence going forward for those bigger days when you hadn't been in that situation before. So it was mightily important. Yeah, indeed. Tell us about Premier Loco, because he's a horse you, you struck up a, a tremendous association with. Yeah, he's a wonderful horse. We had him around for a long time. Bernie Wesley and Jane, his own. Apologies. Uh, we will try and get George back on the line and continue our chat about uh, Premier Loco. In order to do so, we'll just take a quick break. Do you love to stay up to date with all the latest racing action? Do you want exclusive access to breaking news and competitions? Are you looking to connect with fellow racing fans? Look no further. Our social media channels feature everything you love about racing TV and more right at your fingertips. Stay ahead of the game even when you're on the move with breaking news, fast results and racing replays. Available on our Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube channels. With regular social media competitions, polls and discussions, you can connect with thousands of like-minded community members every single day. Stay in the know with 24-7 updates. Available on your laptop, smartphone or tablet. There's always something happening on the Racing TV social media channels. So follow us today. Welcome back. Apologies about the technical glitches. I, I believe we have uh, George back. We were talking about, about Premier Loco. If you could carry on where, where you left off, just telling us a, about this horse and why he was important to you, George. He was just a wonderful horse to have around for a long period of time. He, he got the job done. He, he, he was quite often um, dismissed by um, in the betting and so on, but he, he, was, he ran to a high level of form up to the age of sort of just over eight years of age and he was a multiple group two winner and he was very instrumental in, in my career for me personally because um, he was the first proper good horse I had around for a long period of time and if you're having a quiet run you always knew you had Premier Loco he might be coming out next month in a, in a decent race as such to look forward to so he was instrumental it's taken me to the next level in my career and he was just a horse you could set your watch by early, in, early, earlier in his career. Yeah he came up as I mentioned earlier, George, five years after Wake Up Maggie, um, in, in, those, in those five years, in those intervening years, uh, do you feel that you, you really matured and developed as a jockey? Definitely. I think I, I became more comfortable in my own skin mm -hmm. and, and, and my weight, I became much more regimented with my weight, which is something that I'd struggled with for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And once I seemed to get that under control, it, my 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 career just seemed to snowball later later towards the end of my career as such. Yeah, indeed. And I, 
your your book is called Taking My Time, and I've always uh, took that to be a reference to the fact that you're always very quite patient on horses. You like to ride horses patiently and, and drop them in. But for example, that Celebration Mile it was, a, it was a classic example of the fact that you could you could ride them from the front if necessary because you, you set out to make all on him and set a steady pace out in front, and he rallied for you late on. So it wasn't just about holding horses up. It was, as you said earlier, just getting them into a rhythm, and they end up where they end up. Without doubt, and, and I, one thing I found was I really enjoyed trying to work races out how I thought they'd unfold, and that day in the Celebration Mile, there wasn't much pace on paper. Myself and Chris looked at the track before racing, and we came to the conclusion the best ground was um, seemed to be towards the far side, um, and the ground we felt might have gone against Premier Loco that day, but we, we found a better strip of ground and worked out that there wasn't much pace on paper and it unfolded perfectly. So I really enjoyed that side of it, trying to work out how you could tactically win a race. And, and that was one of those days where you, you felt, felt, felt it ticked the box and got it right. Did you prefer holding horses up? Did you prefer riding them like that? Or did it not really matter? Is that, is that just a, a way that we stereotype you as a jockey somewhat? I always feel that I was prepared to be patient if I thought they were going quick. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't sort of some, someone that felt that I had to do that to be seen to better effect. But if I believed they were going off too quick, I was prepared to take my time and get horse into a rhythm and, and use their energy, at, as you as we were saying earlier on, at the at the right time towards the end of the race. So I believed in what I was doing and, and I, I feel like... Happened again. Um, I apologise. Uh, we'll get George back in a moment or two. See you shortly. From Cork to York, Sandown to Leopardstown, showing every Irish card plus Britain's finest wherever you are. On mobile, online and TV and now in dramatic HD with exclusive previews and features as well as live racing from 61 courses covered by expert names and punditry and of course there's me welcome to the home of british and irish racing hi i'm here with the jewel asco gold cup winner stradivarius on behalf of us we'd like to say thanks to the nhs for doing a sterling job especially a local hospital called newmarket the Royal Suffolk in Barrie and Addenbrooke's in Cambridge. Keep up the good work, take care and thank you again. Well here is Enable in Newmarket. Here we are to thank you all in the NHS for your valiant and brave work in the face of a sinister disease. Thank you specifically to Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge and of course to the West Suffolk and Barrie St Edmunds, our local hospital and our own hospital here in Newmarket, which is a centre for testing. Thank you for everything that you're doing. And Enable is very proud of her new sheet with the heart sign with the NHS on it. Well, welcome back to My Racing Life. We're talking to George Baker uh, this week. And just to take you back, uh, we've taken you from uh, Mark Ushers, uh, where he began his racing career, to winning the Oak Tree Stakes in 2007 on Wake Up Maggie and Premier Loco, then five years later when he was a much mature, more mature uh, and accomplished jockey in 2012. We're going to uh, move on now to uh, one of the best horses he ever rode, Alcazine. Mars towards the outside of Mukadram. These are still the first two. Followed by Al Kazim and Declaration of War has always been his shadow. Miblish towards the inside rail. The Fugue keeping Pastorius in a pocket as they race inside the final three. And now Mukadram presses on. He has Mars being ridden in second. Al Kazim looks for a seam between horses. Then Declaration of War out wide. Mukadram inside the final quarter mile. Still has the lead in the Coral Eclipse. But here comes Al Kazim. Team, Mars and Declaration of War. The Fugue has not fired today. Down towards the final furlong. Mukadram is digging gamely to the inside rail. Al Kazim on all out drive. They've got 150 yards to go. Al Kazim has got the lead for James Doyle. Back in second is Mukadram. Declaration of War begins to fly. They've got now 50 yards to go. And Al Kazim wins the Coral Eclipse. 
the 2013 Coral Eclipse, Al Kazim winning it for uh, Roger Charlton, James Doyle uh, the man on board, but this is a horse that uh, George was later to have a, uh, a really good association with. Uh, George, fond memories of that horse? Yeah, he was a very, very special horse. For me personally, I suppose he's the first group, proper Group 1 horse I was involved ar around. Um, I used to ride out with Mr Charlton's um, a couple of days a week, and I saw him progress from go up through the handicap ranks and up to a Group 1 winner and, and, and that season in 2013 to win the Group 1 treble um, starting off in Ireland through to the Coral Eclipse was a, a fantastic performance and he was a just a wonderful, wonderful individual. Yeah, he's an absolutely brilliant racehorse. We're looking at him uh, at Ascot in the, the Champion Stakes where he, he flashed a huge time figure but still, still was beaten. Um, and yeah, sort of a twist of fate really in that and that it was James Doyle who rode him to win the Eclipse, who rode Noble Mission to beat you on Al Kazim in, in, a, in a thrilling finish. Take us through the race. Yeah, so he ran um, a couple of weeks before um, in the Art de Triumph and ran very well behind Trev. Um, he, he was, I think he finished 10th, but he wasn't beaten that far. And um, they backed him up quite quickly um, to, go, to have a go for the champion stakes. And Noble Mission rolled along in his new, usual fashion. And we sat sort of box seat, got a nice toe of him. And I always felt like I'd get no permission. And, and to be fair, no permission just kept pulling out all the stops. But it was a great battle up the straight. And Al Kazim ran with a great deal of credit, considering he'd come back from going to stud. So it was a wonderful turnaround to see him group one place again. And, and later that, um, beginning of next year, he, won, he, got, he got off the mark and won another group one in the Tattersall Skull Cup. Yeah, it briefly looked, George, just before 100 yards out, as if you, you just hit the front. I definitely hit the front, just, just, in, just inside the furlong, and Noble Mission came back. It was pretty poor ground that day, and they're both two very tough horses, but it was, a, it, was, it was kind of a bittersweet moment because, obviously, to get beaten in a, in a race of that standard is heartbreaking, mm. but at the same time, to have Noble Mission n nearly beaten and for Al Kazim to come back after all the stuff he'd been through um, to get back to that sort of level was massive, really. Yeah, that Champion State's coming in in 2014, seven years on from your success on, on Wake Up Maggie. And, and as you detail in your book, Taking My Time, you, you wanted to get on better horses. It was, more, it was more about quality now when we got round to sort of 2013 onwards. Definitely. And to try and get into that, that Group 1 groove was a... Uh, a, a, a big a big want of mine I feel like that was the next step um, I sort of was riding plenty of winners and, 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 and making a, a nice living but I, I just wanted I wanted better quality of horse and mm. and that, that came around when I was allowed to finally get, get into Roger Charlton's Beckhampton team and Al Kazim was the first proper group one horse I sort of had dealings with really yeah, it was nice to see you interacting with, with James Doyle as you crossed the line there. He's a, he's a good mate of yours and, and you fought out a stirring finish together. Well, it's quite it's funny in a way because I wouldn't have been riding out Kazim if James Doyle wasn't retained by mm. Judd Mont for Noble Mission. So um, myself and James um, rode out together a lot at, at Rogers Holmes and were very good friends still after this day. And... Um, I was delighted for him. If, if I was going to get beaten by anyone, I'm glad it was him. Yeah, indeed. Um, I know it's hard to compare horses across generations, and uh, we on Racing TV ask people to do it all the time, but I'd like you to, to, to rate Al Kazim in terms of all of the horses you've ridden. He's right up there, isn't he? He's up there. He, 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 I'd say he's the best horse I've ridden on, on, on the track, really. Mm. He was a wonderful individual. And Angus, the reason why, one of the reasons why he was so good, he had the, the most fantastic mind and attitude to racing. Mm -hmm. He was very tough, um, even when he came back from stud. And he was, a, he was a big, big unit. He put on a lot of weight when he went to stud to get him fit and to have that mindset to go on to be back to that level. You don't see many horses doing that, really. I, I, we, we, obviously, you get a few, but they have to have the right mind because they can easily let their mind wander and, and go off track. Yeah, and it was a, a good training performance from Roger Charlton. I know we'll talk about Roger a, a little bit later on, but some horses come back, back from stud and, and they don't really want to know, but he, he got this horse firing again. He did, but I think um, I saw Roger talking about this the other day and I was surprised. One, for me, watching him being trained at home, the hardest thing was to get the weight off him without 
before pushing any button to get him fit. So mm. um, he, he devised a plan. I think they used, they did plenty of steady hill work to get get the weight off from early doors when he came back from stud because obviously he was let fully down. The horses aren't normally let fully down when they're even when they're having their breaks from racing. So um, it was a Beck Hampton and, and Roger Charlton's sort of masterpiece really to get him back to that sort of Group One level. Yeah, I always felt that whilst he was a, a top class international racehorse, he never quite got the acclaim he deserved. Would that be fair? I, I completely agree. I think he, that group one treble he did, as we said earlier on, mm. um, the year bef- um, before he went to stud, was just a massive... I, I, I mean, it, I, you just don't see it done very often, do you? you know, it's it massive to turn up on all that, those big days consecutively to, to run to such a high level. And he was... He, he had a, a fantastic will to win. He was just a complete, wonderful horse to have on your side because you know no matter what you ask him to do, he'd give you everything sort of thing. He, he was never looking for ways out of it. He was, he was a fantastic horse like that. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned what happens as far as James Doyle uh, being claimed, of course, by Khalid Abdullah to ride Noble Mission. It, it just sort of highlights a little bit that it doesn't matter sometimes how good you are in this game, that you need a little bit of luck, don't you? Well, for example... Um, James Doyle, when Thistlebird won in Ireland, the Pretty Polly, mm. um, James Doyle couldn't go and ride it because he he was retained by Judd Mont to go to. I think he's ride. I think he rode an Open Mission in France that day. Actually, mm-hmm. um, that was sort of. So it, it's amazing how you have those little. St- you, you need a little bit of luck. So, so sort of, sort of someone's misfortune as such is your your gain. Yeah, indeed. That was Al Kazim, the best horse you ever rode, George. Fascinating thoughts on him. Let's move on. Uh, to another horse. I, I thought this really encapsulated what you were about in terms of riding race horses when this horse won the Wokingham at uh, Ascot. Interception. Up front then is Diamond Bell and Martin Lane in front. Pressed on the wide outside now by Foxtrot Jubilee. Up the inside by King Lamy. Slip starting away in the yellow colours. Trying to weave its way through. Gets a nice split on the inner. And five and a line then as they race up towards the final furlong. Slip starting away on the far side with King Lamy. Battling bravely. Foxtrot Jubilee down the centre. Interception leaving it oh so late on the near side. Also flying home. It's end of his spirit. It's going to be tight. Foxtrot Jubilee. Interception. What a ride. Yeah, that was a handicap at Kempton that uh, interception uh, won uh, amazingly off a, a very low mark. It was off 85 for the David Lanigan team. Ted Durkin was on board there and um, must have been chucked in off 85 given that she went to win a Wokingham off 102, George. Yeah, she. Um, the, re- the reason why I put her down on my horse is so I just started riding for her owner, Bjorn Nilsson, who mm-hmm. had the majority of his team with David Lanigan and Lambourne at his stables. And it was a massive, for, for me personally, it was one of the, my best days in the saddle because it was a master plan. It, we, we'd sort of plotted that at the beginning of the year to go for the Wokingham. Um, she had a prep race at Haydock mm. um, at the end of May in, in a Phillies listed race where she was beaten, but she, we, we knew she'd benefit for that. And she was, she was, very, she, she was far from straightforward Philly to train at home. She was quite quirky. It was hard to get the work into her without blowing her brains. Mm. And she became quite... Um, Larry getting her to go on the gallops and stuff like that. So um, to get that box ticked to ride a Royal Ascot winner for your sort of new job as such mm. was a was a big thing, and I got a lot of personal satisfaction out of that. One because I rode her out, um, I rode her in the majority of her work at home, um, and it was it was just a very sort of fulfilling thing to do. To to to, to when when you sort of have a plan like that and it comes off, it's massively it, it's very satisfying. Yeah, absolutely. To put it in context, that handicap we saw her winning, uh, I think it was off a mark of 80, actually, uh, under Ted Durkin was in 2013, and then lightly raced until the Wokingham in 2015. Just just tell us how the race went for you. A uh, couple of things struck me when I looked back at it. Uh, one was that the ground was really fast, and, and, and I presume that that's what, exactly what she wanted, and she wanted a strong gallop to go at. You're dead right, Angus. To be seen to best effect, she wanted a really, really strong gallop to chase. Um, not because, just so you could get into a nice rhythm. She was very quirky to get her down to the track. You, you, she, she'd plant herself, went cantering down, so you'd have to take her down early and lead her the majority of the way. The army um, used to put her in the stalls. She was just very, very, she wasn't straightforward by any means. Mm. But the key thing with her was quick ground. And 
when she got it, she, that's when you saw her to best effect. And um, that day, Asuka, it was lightning quick. And it really, really suited her the strong pace, come off a strong pace like that on, on very quick ground. I always sort of get the impression, really, that she's the sort of horse that that you used to love riding. A few little, few little quirks, a little bit like Wake Up Maggie to a, to a degree, and a horse that wants to come off a strong pace and wants to, wants to be uh, dropped out. That would be, be your dream ride, wouldn't it, just about? Yeah, she was... I suppose when you got it right on her, there was a lot of satisfaction, mm. but a lot of the time it wouldn't work quite quite well. And we really struggled with later in her career to get the ground. Yeah. Um, even good soft ground wasn't ideal. And, and obviously after she won that... Um, Heritage Handicap winning the Wokingham. We were try trying to win a black type race with her and she never did it. She had black type place, but she, she, was, she wasn't a black type winner, which was frustrating because she was talented enough to do that. But I suppose you need, she needed things to fall the right way and it's just, and it, ne it never really transpired like that later in her career. Yeah, do you think, you think she could have won a, a group two, possibly a group one on, on, on fast ground if everything went her way? I, I, do you know what? I, I don't believe she was a group one filly, but right. she was definitely, she would have won. I think there's quite a good fillies um, group hand, um, group race at um, York. And if she'd had her ground, that would have been the perfect place for her. But it was always just a little bit too loose for her up there. Mm. This was 2015 then, George. and We've taken you from 2007. Do you, uh, do you feel you at your peak of your powers around about 2015, 2016? I suppose, for me personally, when... Um, I went and met Bjorn Nilsson in Lambourne that uh, evening, and he asked me to go there. That was, it was a massive confidence boost to be asked to ride, to have a yard full of nice horses that were definitely my horses to ride for the year. Mm. And um, I was very happy in my own skin then, and I was really enjoying my racing. Um, I was went into Dave Lanigan's twice a week to ride work. Um, they were very kind to let me kept continue my association with Roger Charlton, and I still went up to Newmarket to ride out. So I was. I was busy, but I was I had a nice bunch of horses to ride, and I was really enjoying it. Yeah, you'd established some some really good connections by this stage of your career, hadn't you? And that's so important. Definitely, and I was riding the people that I got on well with. Yeah. So we had good working relationships, so it was enjoyable. So the majority of the time, they'd let you get on with it. Mm. Um, they know that you're trying to achieve the same things, and I suppose when you get to that sort of level, it just becomes you're not chasing your tail. You were able to get into a nice routine, and and it, and I, I didn't see it as work as such. It was I was getting paid to do my hobby, so it was a great great time. Mm. You, you mentioned confidence a little bit earlier on. Um, uh, did your confidence take a knock at all if, if things didn't go right? And uh, the way you rode horses in a patient manner, by and large, things things can can go against you, and people can throw a little bit of a bit of mud at you for timing it wrong or getting boxed in and all this sort of thing, the sort of things that people level at uh, the brilliant Jamie Spencer, sometimes they could be levelled at you. Did that affect your confidence at all if that happened? Um, honestly, I, I never got affected by stuff like that. I believed in what I was doing and I know that I was trying to do my best. It wasn't like I was playing at it. I was trying to get the best results mm. and sometimes it doesn't work out. I suppose even when you're riding... I think my best strike rate for a season was up to nearly 20%. So 80% yeah. of the time you're, you're, you're getting it wrong. And, and I had very thick skin. I, I just even, I used to get some abuse on social media and so on. Mm. And it just wouldn't bother me at all. I just get on with it, um, believed in what I was doing and, and I enjoyed it. And I suppose I was lucky the people that I was riding for um, were all great people to work for and understood if things didn't go right that, that you, you, you'd get it right next time. Shows a real strength of character, though, to ignore that, ignore that kind of thing and actually believe in what you're doing and just carry on doing it. So my normal routine, Angus, would be I'd go home, watch my day's rides, even if things hadn't gone right, mm. and I'd analyse them in my head and say, I should have done, maybe done this or why did I switch up to follow that horse when I should, could have waited or whatever it may be, and I'd drop it and move on to the next day because one thing I never wanted to do was feel like it was hindering my ride into the future, so I'd be quite pragmatic about it, watch the replays and then just forget about it and, 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 and try and learn from it rather than hold it against me. And you sort of see some lads in the weighing room that they just couldn't let it drop, you know, if something hang on right. And I think the best jockeys are good in defeat as, as well as winning. Yeah, it's, a, it's quite a, a studious approach. Did you do the same with, with horses that, that you won on, that you went back and sort of asked yourself, well, why did, why did that horse win? What did I do well on that to win on it? As, rather than just always looking at those you got beaten on? 
definitely I, 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 I did get as much enjoyment. I get plenty of enjoyment getting home and watching mm. nice winners and people saying nice things about you, but I wouldn't sort of get sort of caught up in the moment and thinking I was better than I was. I, I just was always trying to strive to get the best out of the horse I was dealing with. Mm. And whether that be maybe... I used to love watching replays of horses that I hadn't ridden before when I got a chance to ride them mm-hmm. and work out how I could improve what they'd done, if that makes sense. So I was almost... I always looked at myself a little bit as a problem solver yeah, and trying to work out how I could get the best out of the horse I was riding. And I think all all good jo- all the better class of jockeys do that. But, and some of them find it a very natural thing to do. Yeah, a studious approach, I perhaps would describe it as, George. And I'm sure that you, you did your homework before riding a horse who was really tricky. Chill the kite. They field already pretty well strung out as they approach the halfway stage. Extremity comes next, followed by Melvin the Great Fort Bastion. Then one word more at the back of the field, together with on the outside, then Chill the Kite. And finally, two for two, the two of them at the back of the field, about 15 lengths off the speed. And they've gone very quick up front here. Collini leads them down towards the final three furlongs. He's four to five lengths clear now of Balducci. Montras pushed along. He's no saint, chasing hard as well. Is penitent. Marjol is being driven hard. Alfred. Hutchinson is trying to weave his passage through switches left there on the outside Musadas Fort Bastion is staying on Durley Chill the Kite's got it all to do but Kalini and Gary Halpin remain the ones to catch, they're clear entering the final furlong by about five or six lengths, here comes Alfred Hutchinson to give chase as Kalini edges towards the near side rail, then Melvin the Great staying on with Chill the Kite on the far side who's really running a big finish but it's still just in front Kalini, can he make all, he's been gathered in Alfred Hutchinson and Chill the Kite on the far side to the line they go chill the kite got there what a ride from Alfred Hutchinson Kalini third then Melvin the Great followed by one word more Musadas next and Mike Catamol commentating there and giving George the accolades what a ride he said as chill the kite uh, crossed the line in front in what was the Lonsdale Cup in 2016 George what are your memories of that it must have been some thrill riding in that race yeah, he was. Um, I loved Chill the Kite. I was associated with him for quite a long period of time. I didn't really ride him out of home as such, but he was a high class handicapper who was very talented. But the, he was so difficult, Angus. I promise you, you ride him six times and one time you get it right. So you'd feel like an absolute genius, but it'd be heartbreaking the other times because he needed things to unfold in a certain way. He was such a hard horse. He was the keenest horse I ever rode on the track. Um, getting into the start was hard work to get him down there in, in the right frame of mind without burning up too much energy nice and steady mm. and get, to get him to relax early doors in a race was difficult and you have to sort of take it off him and get him to and you needed a fast pace to do that so they come back to you um if the, if he was amongst horses he he just raced too freely so he was he was not an easy horse to, to ride but once you worked him out he was um i got a lot of satisfaction out of riding him but he was a nearly horse for me because he should have won the hunt cup um, a couple, well, he, he definitely should have won it, won it the first time I rode him in it when he finished second to field a dream of Jamie Osborne's and then he was placed in it again. So he was one of those horses that you had some, I had some really good days in him, but it was, he was nearly one of those horses. He was, he was a very big favourite of mine, but he was very frustrating at the same time. Yeah, there he is coming back in after winning that Clipper Logistics stakes at York in, in 2015. You say he was very difficult, George, and, and, and you... He struggled to get him settled. How, just tell us, how did you get him settled? How, what was your knack? What was your trick? How did you make this horse settle and relax? I know you got a really strong gallop uh, at York, but, but nonetheless, you managed to get him to, to switch off. Yeah, he was interested in the respect that it wasn't brute force. It had to be, you have to be, have very soft hands with him in, in a race. Getting him to start was a different thing. You just have to sort of almost sit against him and lock, lock the rein so he could, so, and trot him down mm. in the race. You'd almost want to miss it half a beat out the stalls and just not touch the reins and get cover straight away. So hopefully you could just track him behind something. And the first couple of furlongs would just get him into a nice economical rhythm. Mm. And when you did that, then he'd always finish off strongly for you. But he was a very willing horse and wanted to do things the wrong way around, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. But just explain, though, to, to people you know, haven't ridden a horse, haven't ridden, ridden a racehorse. You're talking about jumping him out of the, the gates, just missing it a little bit. But then if you started to fight him and pull at him to get him to come back to you 
and drop in behind. He would take he would take you on. He'd want he'd want that fight, wouldn't he? Yeah, he was he was a very wooden horse, mm. and he, he he wanted you to take him on. Um, so you had to sort of almost. I used to sort of bury my hand into his mane as such, or, or the mech strap, and, and, and try not to touch his mouth, which was a hard thing to do at times. Mm. But if they, for example, he was seen to best affect no big handicaps because if you've got a strong pace like we did at York that day behind Kalini, who went off very, very quickly, everything sort of, it's, it, it's easier to get him into that rhythm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He it was, it was a frustrating horse because I think he, he was probably a be- better horse than a high class handicap, but the, the reason why he, those, those races unfolded the right way for him, whereas those sort of better class races where they're smaller fields and it was tactically, you, you wouldn't get such a strong pace. He was very difficult to ride in those races. Yeah. We're getting a bit of a theme here, George. You know, talking about uh, Wake Up Maggie and we're talking about Interception and now uh, Chill the Kite. These are horses who were, who were tricky. They're horses that sort of fit the profile of ones that you, you wanted to work out and those are the ones you enjoyed riding. Yeah. Chill the Kite was a firm favourite of mine. You sort of kind of get because I've rode him for a long time. I got to know his owners, Graham Doyle and Hazel Lawrence, very well, and and it was good. It was good fun to be associated with. But at the same time, it could be uber frustrating, and I could see that in their faces sometimes when things didn't go quite right. But they stuck with it, and um, I had some good days on him. But he was frustrating because he definitely should have won the Hunt Cup. He was second behind Jamie Osborne's horse field a dream that day off a mark of 109, which is a, a massive performance, and he was unlucky. So. He, he would have nearly won a hunt couple for a mark of 109. That, that takes quite a good horse to do that. Yeah, he, he just it was a bit frustrating that he didn't win a bit more, wasn't it, overall? His, his overall record was a little bit disappointing, but that's just the, the, the type that he was. Yeah, I think if, he, if he'd been more tactically versatile, he mm. would have been a group horse for sure. But because he, because he needed things to unfold in a certain way, I don't think he, as you say, he didn't win enough races, as, as his talent would, would say he should do. Yeah, but uh, well handled by trainer uh, Huey Morrison to win that Clipper Logistics Stakes and a brilliantly timed challenge, if I may say so, uh, from George on that horse. Now, a much more straightforward individual. He's done, I think he was a bit more straightforward. George will tell us his quest for more. Here he is winning the Lonsdale Cup in 2016. Quest some more goes for home. He leads by over two lengths to Palisade. To Wicklow Brave in the purple is cutting stylishly through the pack. Trip to Paris is ridden along. Clever Cookie at this stage, a little outpaced. So too Keb, your enthusiasm and sued you. And on down towards the last quarter mile. Quest some more. Wicklow Brave though emerges to give chase. Then Palisade, a trip to Paris. Clever Cookie is no better than fifth. Still over a furlong to go. Wicklow Brave and Palisade now come to challenge Quest some more on either side. Quest some more there is game he's sticking his nose down and he's fighting off all challengers quest some more drawing clear on the run to the line and quest some more makes all to win the Lonsdale Cup yeah that man George Baker who always holds horses up makes all in the Lonsdale Cup to win on quest for more uh, George that was a that was a change of tactics for this horse wasn't it yeah he'd um he'd been to that winter had been over to um, Australia, the Melbourne Cup, and mm. he came back and he took a while to find his feet to get back into a routine. And I rode him at Goodwood in the Goodwood Cup that year, and I wasn't beaten that far behind Big Orange. I think we finished sixth. And I feel I rode, I was just way too negative on him on a horse that stayed well. And I, 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 I sort of, we come to the conclusion, myself and Roger, before that Longsdale Cup that day, that we'd roll along, keep things simple. There wasn't particularly much pace on paper. Palisator was the only other horse that might roll along, but I got the vibe they were keen to take a lead. So we rolled along in front, and it was a, it was kind of the next step. He stepped up from being a high-class horse to, to, to being a Group 1 winner. Um, it was interesting how how he sort of improved so slowly. I, I'll never forget, towards, I think it was the end of 2014, he won a handicap, a competitive handicap at Ascot, and I remember talking to Roger Charlton, maybe it was on the way home or the next couple of days, and we were going through the horses that were, and he said, what do you think about Chris Moore? And I said, well, maybe that was his ceiling. I think he won off a mark of 87 that day. Um, it might be worth moving him on, and thank God they didn't, because <laughs> he, went, he went from strength to strength after that. And the next season he won the Northumberland Plate, was placed in the Goodwood Cup, and then um, the year after that, he, 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 he obviously was a, won a group one so he was a mm. fantastic horse and, and he just kept on improving and 
and it was no, by no means, for, for me, it was one of the most satisfying days when you went to France and won over there to win a group one on, on a big day like that. Mm. Me, and it was at Chantilly when it was moved. Yes. Um, to win the CAD round was a, a massive thing and um, it was very, very satisfying day in the saddle considering we we talked about it myself beforehand with Mr Charlton to roll along on the front end and for whatever reason I just couldn't, I, I don't know whether they were going too quick or what, what it was but he just was not going with any fluency early doors mm. so I took my time, we ended up sitting last and, and we nabbed the zero band on, 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 the, on the line so it was a very satisfying day. Yeah, that, the, remind me, that was the day... Obviously, you beat the great Vizera Bad, but you came you came quite wide up the home straight. Is that right? Yeah, it was more so because I could see the field stopping in front of me. Mm -hmm. um, it was hard to pick your route, and I was trying to keep an eye on Christoph on on Vizera Bad where he was going, and he he ended up so he came out, and I sort of came with him, but he as as. As he quickened and hit the front, he, his horse sort of rolled to the rail, and I, I was mindful not to go too near to him because I think Zirabo was quite a, he, he was a very talented horse, multiple Group One winner, but I kind of felt that I wanted to challenge away from him if possible, mm. um, so it worked out quite well. But it was a bit of, I suppose, when when Christoph first came out, I looked to go inside because I didn't want to, I wanted to race away from him if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But as it worked out, it unfolded perfectly. But it was quite funny. Roger Charlton tells a funny story. He was watching the race at home. He, he didn't go to France that day. And um, he, he went off and made himself a cup of tea where he, when he saw I was sat last early doors because he thought I had no chance. <laughs> what, so to explain to me, why, why did you decide to, to sit so far back in, in that particular contest? Was it because you thought there was a lot of pace on? It was w weird because I, we, 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 we felt we were going to roll along and make the running. Um, there was a horse in the race called Mille Me, mm -hmm. who, who used to make the running, subsequently won the, won, was a winner of the CAD run. But for whatever reason, he, was, he wasn't that quick and destroyed in France that day, and he wasn't early doors and going with any fluency. So I just thought, I'm not going to annoy him and, and just keep, keep at him. I'll just take my time and just rode the race as it unfolded. And, and luckily, it worked out perfectly because the zero bad took his time, and we got we were able to sort of not follow him through as such, but we got a nice tone to the race from him, and it worked out perfectly. But it was completely against the grain of what we we decided mm. to do hand before. Yeah, sometimes Plan B has to has to uh, be used, George. Uh, he was a. We talked about some quirky individuals that you got the best out of. He was pretty straightforward, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. He was a proper stayer, mm. gallop all day. And, 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 and was very, very genuine and straightforward in that respect. I think he was quite a fragile horse at home. So you, I, I didn't really, I didn't ride him work that often. And I just, I think they, they sort of keep him ticking over nice and steadily at home. The old time I'd sit on him, he was just very straightforward individual, nice way about him and, and, and knew how to get the job done and win. Yeah, and he, was, he made up what was a tremendous year for you in 2016. And of course it was capped off with classic success in the St. Ledger. So they're reaching the last quarter mile. Argyle's lead has been withered away now by the stride as Harbour Law joins in on the outside and passes him and goes for home. City of Ideas is getting up ahead of steam. Now moves into second place. Harbour Law in front though as they approach the final furlong. This big colt in the hands of George Baker is pouring it on inside the final furlong. Rassasi though is finishing off pretty strongly on the outside as is October Storm. Harbour Law though is going to do enough and hangs on to five top weight. Well, you really wouldn't believe that he won a handicap at Sandown off a mark of 85 and he went on to, to win a St Ledger under George making great strides to do so giving George the final classic of the season in 2016 for, for Laura Mong and a fantastic success uh, for her that was some progression that he made George yeah he I, I think I, I, I rode him second time out um, first run for Laura Mongan as a trainer. He was with Joe Crowley when he got, I think, mm. he was second first first ever run for her. And then he went to Laura Mongan's and he won at Salisbury. And he, he won like a nice horse, but by no means w were we thinking he was sort of a group stand horse. And then he went to Sandown and he was he was quite impressive on the card that day. And it was a competitive race. There was quite a lot of talk about 
a few of them being better cl- better handicapped horses, if that makes sense. Mm. They had a bit in hand. Um, so obviously we went to Ascot after that for for the for the stay in three year old race. Um, and he, I felt I we were beaten by Sword Fight, who was given a brilliant ride by Conor McDonald, who got a very soft time on the front end. And I felt maybe I should have challenged Colin a bit earlier. I, I, I might well have won that day at Royal Ascot. So the, the, the St. Ledger was mentioned after he, he put up a good performance at Royal Ascot. And I remember speaking to Laura and, and Ian Mongan, and they mentioned the Bahrain Trophy. So we went to the Bahrain Trophy, which was kind of a good, it has been a good ledger trial in the past. Um, and he went there, and, and, and the ground was too quick from that day, and he never really let himself down. He, was, he was, wasn't beaten that far by House of Parliament, but he ran a very solid race. But I just knew straight away when we, when we sort of went into the, into the dip on the July track, he, he wasn't really letting himself down. Um, and it, it was a really good performance. So I was very keen afterwards that they, they still went, for, had, had a go at the same measure because if, I thought if there was more cut in the ground, he'd be competitive. So they were very patient, Laura and Ian Mongan. And they took him to Kempton. I think it was about 10 days before the ledger. And I went and rode and worked there. And he worked, he apparently was a very lazy workhorse, but he worked quite nicely that day. And um, that was, that was the plan was made to go for the ledger and it all worked out. It was a great day. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, he was, a, he was an outsider for a, for a small stable. Did you go there with, with some confidence? It sounds like you, you did. I, 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 wouldn't, I didn't go there thinking that we'd win, but I thought we could definitely be placed and be competitive. Um, Idaho was a red-hot favourite. And obviously he unseated Jamie Heffern, and so that, that helped our cause. Hmm. Um, I think Idaho was, you know, sort of stand out. Everyone thought it was just a, a it was just going to be a, he was going to win and win comfortably. But when he got unseated, it made it more, a very open race. And Pablo put in a wonderful performance to get up late on to, to get Venture Sure Storm. Hmm. But again, we look into it, there wasn't much pace on paper beforehand, so we were going to be riding nice and positively. But for whatever reason, they ended up going quite hard. Sword fight made the running of um, Aidan O'Brien's and set a really strong gallop, probably for Idaho's benefit. And w- when that happened, I was just went to Plan B and, and rode him with plenty of restraint. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you've mentioned some of the big owners, and big trainers that, that you rode through through throughout your career, but it must have given you a lot of satisfaction to be able to ride a, a Group One Classic winner for a, a, a small team based in Epsom, the, the team of, of the Mongans. Yeah. Obviously, I was in the weighing room for a long time with Ian when he was riding and got to know Laura better when Ian retired because I started to ride for her quite regularly. And when Joe Crowley retired, she, she got this horse and it was became quite apparent, I think, when Salisbury and they, they, they really liked him. He was, I think, a different class of horse than they'd ever had in the yard before. And and they, they, they did a brilliant job because they were patient. Sometimes when these smaller yards get a nice horse, they, they tend to run them more regularly because it's it, to their advantage to have them out running and keep their name in those bigger races. Mm-hmm. They were very patient when it didn't work out in the Bahrain Trophy, mapped out perfectly for the St. Ledger. And it was, you know, they, they went there confident, but obviously we thought we had it all to do to beat Idaho. And when when what, when when he unseated Jamie Heffernan, it just made it a very open race. Yeah, indeed. No, it's a fantastic success for you, George. I mean, you've talked about Alcazine, you've talked about horses that were really important to you uh, in your career. How important was, was, was this horse? How important was Harbour Law to you? I suppose, looking back at it now, now I'm retired and so on, it's a lovely thing to do when you can say that you won a, a British Classic because they're mm. not easy to do. There's a lot of jockeys that aren't able to ride those Classic winners in England. Mm. And to have that ticked off on your CV is, is a massive thing. And um, little did I know that it was going to be my last season riding. So it's, um, it was a, it was a, it's a, when you look back at it now, it's a big deal. But at the time, because I'd had a really productive year, not that I was expecting it by any means, but I, I kind of felt that this was where I wanted to be. So I, was, I wasn't looking at it thinking, oh, it's great, I won a classic. And if mm. I never do it again, it doesn't matter. It was something I wanted to do more often, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, fabulous success on Harbour Law. We've asked you, George, to uh, name a trainer and a jockey who have formed an important part of uh, of your racing life, and you've nominated uh, Roger Charlton as your trainer. There's Roger on the gallops. 
commanding the troops. What's so special about Roger Charlton, George? So I suppose I spent a lot of time with Roger Charlton at Beckhampton when I was riding out there, and he's just got a, a wonderful way, a wonderful eye with horses. Um, you know, he, he he's very mindful. He doesn't he doesn't miss anything. He he's very, for example, he, he loves watching the horses trot round in the morning, and he's got a very good eye to see all oh, that horse isn't moving as well as it was yesterday. So he he he's just a great person to be around, and I love being involved with Beckhamp, and I was made to part, feel part of the family as such. And if I had to have a horse, the way I looked at it is I was I was thinking if I had a horse in, a horse in training, so I've done a lot of sort of looking up trainers that were very successful back in the day and so on but i was kind of thinking if i had to have a horse in training where would i want to have, have it and i'd have it at beckhampton because i just love being there and I, and I and i get on so well with roger and the team there so yeah i just think he's what he did with al kazim for me and and in later years i'm decorated night and aspatar last year and obviously the philly and quadrilateral he's sort of a, a very able person with those group one individual he, he's a very good target trainer and that's why i'd have my horse if i had a, if i had a top class horse yeah george do you still keep in touch with him do you still go there regularly um i i, I pop in there now and then to, mm-hmm. and I, I i i speak to his son harry quite a bit mm-hmm. um but i will i suppose once um we're out of the lockdown and we can get around a bit more i'll definitely pop in there again because i, I love being around there and i've got i became quite friendly with a few of the staff there they were very helpful to me that have been at Beckhampton a long time. So it's a it's a it's a wonderful place to spend time if that makes sense. And I felt very at home there. Yeah, fantastic. He's a brilliant trainer, isn't he? A real, as you say, a target trainer, but a patient trainer. And horses just continually improve and improve when they're in his care. What about the jockey then, George? Is the jockey who's influenced your career the most, the one you look up to, I guess? Um, and it's well, number one rider in the world, in my opinion, Ryan Moore. Yeah, for me, Mr. Moore, um, I was lucky enough to sit by him for a long time through, throughout, throughout my career. Mm. And we're both, seated, we have the same ballot and um, I spent a lot of time with him, rode a lot for his dad. And I, I suppose I, I was thinking about it the other day, I was very lucky that he, he has done so well because it meant he wasn't available to ride for his dad that often. So it was quite handy <laughs> for me. But he he's ultimate, he's... I think he's, he, he, for me, he changed the way in room mentality when he came along. Um, people talk about AP McCoy came along and he, he didn't drink and he was very sensible. Ryan Moore came along and the same sort of thing, really. Um, tactically, he's second to none for me and he's so effective in a finish. Um, he's worked so hard at his fitness and, he, and he, I feel like he's made everyone raise their game, really, in the flat wine room. And he's just, for me, he's the ultimate jockey. He's, he's just brilliant. Uh, did you confide in him quite a lot? Um, no, I didn't because he just take, he'd take the mick out of me if I did angle too much. <laughs> if, if, if I had something serious to say, you could chat to him seriously about something. But um, I wouldn't. I'm, I'm, he, he's, he, he's got a very, very sort of good sense of humour, mm. and um, I just I enjoyed sitting by him because he's he's very light-hearted and he's good fun to be around. Yeah, and he. I mean, it's, it's hard for me to sort of describe what I'm thinking, but he just gets it, doesn't he, George? He just understands racing and race riding. I think he's, he, he, he again, he loves working races out. Mm. And you've just got to look for the people that he's ridden for through his career. He was at Richard Hannon's. And when you see Rich Chew saying, I saw this kid coming along and he's, I realise I've got to raise my game to be, otherwise he's, he's going to sort of overtake me. That's all you need to know, isn't it, when Rich Chew's is saying something like that. Yeah. So... And then he went to Sir Michael Stouts after that, and now he's got the Ballet Door job, which is, for me, probably the, the best job in racing. Yeah, it's almost ironic then that um, uh, the most winners you rode for any individual trainer was Gary Moore uh, <laughs> in your career. Um, George, we're, we're drawing to a close. Thank you so much for sharing your racing life with us. I, I'm going to sort of end by quoting what Ryan Moore said about you in your book. Um, he says that George had every attribute that you would look for in a top jockey. I admired him as a rider and I continue to admire him as a person. No better accolade could be received, I don't think, for a man such as yourself than that given to you by Ryan Moore. George, thank you very much indeed for sharing your racing life with us here uh, today. It's so good to speak to you again. Thanks a lot, Angus. Good to speak to you. Thanks to George Baker for joining us on the line, talking through the horses that and people that influenced him throughout his career. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.